We are creatures of desire. What we most desire is meaning. What makes us suffer most is a lack of meaning. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Marital therapist, author, and communications trainer Andrew G. Marshall invites guests from all walks of life to discuss what makes life meaningful. Hello, I'm Andrew G. Marshall, and my witness today on The Meaningful Life is Tim Dowling. Tim writes a weekly column for The Guardian newspaper about the ups and downs of family life. Among the books he's written is How to Be Happy All the Time. He plays for the group police dog Hogan, and although he lives in London, originally comes from Connecticut, USA. Thank you very much for being my witness today, Tim. How do you feel about actually being a guest on a podcast about the meaningful life? I suppose a little apprehensive. I'm one of those people who I think of life as being intrinsically pretty meaningless. That meaning, meaning is something you have to ascribe. You have to do all the work to make meaning out of it. So I feel like I should have maybe run that past you first in case you said, well, that's no good. But uh, I've, it's, it feels like a big responsibility, actually. Because you generally quite like approaching everything through your sense of humour, I, I imagine. Am I right with that? Yes. I think that's a, a very early and ongoing defence mechanism. It's an easy way to admit to embarrassing failings. And if you make a joke about yourself, I think, you know, you learn quite early on as a child, if you're any good at it anyway, that if you make a joke about yourself, it stops. You get in there before anyone else can. So that was your way of coping when you were a child? When I was a child, I was terribly shy. So, I mean, my first defense mechanism was absolute silence. And then later, you know, amongst close friends and people I felt comfortable with, I started to develop a sense of humor. But it took a long time just because I was not a performer, you know. In fact, one of the reasons why I was interested in talking to you is because I sort of suspect that humour is actually quite important in actually finding life meaningful, that it's a way almost sometimes of smuggling some real truths into a conversation. I think when, you, when you're writing, you have more control still, which means you're not simply trying to deflect from your own faults or, or, to, or to entertain people and, and, and keep them from seeing what a miserable failure you really are. It's more like you can, something about the meaning of life, something about truisms or the way relationships work can be uncovered in a way that's more palatable, I suppose, is more entertaining than a, a life lesson. And you think that meaning is something we assign rather than something that's actually intrinsically in something? I do think of the universe as a sort of cold, meaningless environment. I think we make meaning out of our lives in a way just by making stories of our lives. I mean, we have no control over the future. We have a a quite odd relationship with the present most of the time. And the past is something we recast and retell ourselves over and over again to make sense of what's coming next, to make sense of what's gone before, or to make sense of what's happening now. The good thing about it is it I think it's a bit like time travel in that you're never really finished with the story. You can always go back and recast your whole childhood as as something else. As you as you get older and get smarter, you you realize new things about what happened to you previously. So you've actually been looking at your life in quite some depth because for the last 13 years, you have to pull something out of your life every week. So it's yeah. sort of a bit like keeping a diary, isn't it? Yeah, at, at quite some length, if not quite some depth. It is like keeping a diary, although sometimes when I, I occasionally teach these Guardian Masterclasses and I always say, if you're going to do this kind of writing, it shouldn't sound like a diary. It shouldn't sound like read like a letter home. It's all right if it's therapeutic for you but the reader shouldn't feel like they've done you a giant favour by reading it. You're there to entertain, to make some connection with people who you don't know. So how has your life changed over these last 13 years, from the man that first sat down and wrote the first column to the the man that I'm speaking to today, do you think? Uh, A, I think I freak out a lot less about the column itself than I used to. I now allow myself to freak out about it only one day a week, so it doesn't ruin the whole week. It used to, it ruined probably the entire autumn of 2007, I would say, when I started, because I just originally, you know, they said 
the only instruction I got from the editor when I started the column was, I don't want you to feel that you have to write about your own life. And I just think she thought that a lot of people would find that too personal, or maybe she didn't think I would be very good at it. I didn't ask her. I just thought, I won't. Don't worry, I won't. And then I panicked on the first one, and I wrote something about something that happened to me at home that week because I couldn't think of anything else. And I spent six months trying to get away from it, trying to get back to something more like an essay, more topical. And I finally sort of did. And six months later, I got the only other email I got from the editor about it. And it just said, what happened to the funny wife? So I painted myself into this corner. I had to carry on after that. And then you had to find yourself a funny <laughs> wife. <laughs> a funny wife over and over again. Say something funny now. I had quite small kids in those days. It was a very domestic, at-home column that was, you know, I was trying to make my life sound like every other ordinary person's life with the sort of ups and downs of all that. And as it moves on, you have to sort of move with it. You have to, the column itself sort of changes. It, it becomes slightly less about my kids because they have a, a right to ownership over their own lives. And, you know, when they're little, you sort of control all that. You say, this is what happened to you today. Mm-hmm. And now they're not terribly interested in being in it, if I'm asked. So do you have to negotiate with them if you want I to? I used to. If- I, yeah, I used to actually pay them five pounds if I could. <laughs> it cost you more. Well, I said... That you got, did it, after a while. I did say, I'm not going to warn you. You have to come and find me and say, you've quoted me directly. I claim my five pounds. And they never read anything I write. So I didn't have to shout out that often. And a couple of times when I really wanted to write about something, I remember there was a time when, just when my youngest one, who's the last one to go to secondary school, and that rite of passage that you have where you take them in the morning, but they find their own way back in the afternoon. And thereafter, that's the last you, you don't take your kids to school anymore. They make their own way. So I took him on the train and he, the school was quite far away. And I said, are you sure you're all right? And he said, yeah, yeah, don't worry, I'll come home. And uh, about the time we would have expected to see him come home, the phone rang and my wife picked it up and she said, hello. And then there was this huge long silence. And then she said, so are the police with you now? And he'd got completely lost and then caught in this huge downpour and he had to be escorted home on the train. I met him at the train and he was wearing this huge, long school track suit that was four sizes too big for him because he'd been soaking wet and carrying his bag, you know, in a bin liner. He was carrying his wet uniform. And uh, he came off the train. He stared at me with these tiny, he has tiny, icy blue eyes. And he just looked up at me and he said, you can't write about this. And I said, of course not. But a week later, I was... I had to make it, I had to strike a deal with him. I was like, I have to write about this. 15 pounds he got for that. And he deserved it. And I, for the only, only the one time in my life that I ever gave him copy approval, I let him read it before I sent it out. So how have you changed yourself? How have I changed? I've got a lot older. I think one of the things is you don't necessarily expect when you embark on something like a column that it's going to last that long. And you don't have any plan for how you're going to carry it on. And you don't know what your life is going to be like. I don't know the, that thing that you read where they, you start to dig yourself out of a trough of depression after you pass 47 or so, that's meant to be the sort of lowest age where people's lives are at their most chaotic and they feel unempowered. And then you, start, you just start to feel better. And I have become less, I guess, less, ang- I, I'm quite an anxious person, but I'm less anxious about just stuff that I've done over and over again. I don't like unknown things. So I feel like life gets quite rehearsed after 50. You feel like you've done everything at least once. And uh, some of the fear just lifts, maybe. I've been writing about myself, um, keeping sort of diaries, that I, some of which I've published. And I think that I've discovered a lot about myself. It's sort of almost a way of actually me working out what is meaningful in my life mm. and mm. who am I and other things like that. Do you think there is a there is some element of that in writing about yourself. Absolutely, because I think the primary, from my point of view anyway, the the primary purposes of it is to be honest with yourself and with the reader. And I think if you're not, people can see through that pretty quickly. So I spend a lot of the time that I'm writing it trying to get to get the right emotion, you know, to remember the emotion that I was feeling at the time and and to cast it right or to really think about how I said the wrong thing and why it mattered and and how that would have made someone else feel. And even if I'm doing that to try and be funny, I'm trying to be accurate about it. And you you sort of learn a lot about the mistakes you make, and especially the mistakes you make over and over again, because they come around again. I find that when I write about myself, I can sort of mentally put myself back into that moment 
and mm -hmm. sort of mine it a bit deeper than I did at the time. So I've got enough room to look a little bit deeper into myself, begin to get some sense of the unconscious material that maybe I wasn't aware of. It's almost a little bit like writing yourself into your own body, if that doesn't sound yeah. too yeah. weird. Well, it is that idea of making meaning out of something that's already happened. When things happen, you don't really think about what they mean because you're just trying to get through them. You're just weathering a storm. And you're also trying to write about, from a surely dramatic point of view, from mine, point of view, I want things that go wrong are interesting and, and they're funny, but they're not funny then. And they're not necessarily instructive, even unless you go back and, and, and think about what you can draw from the experience. And I think you can only do that when some of the emotion of the moment has worn off. You, know, you have to wait a week or, or two. Yeah, because at the time you just feel panic and then probably you discover there's all sorts of other emotions underneath the panic as well. Yeah. And sometimes even recalling it is quite emotional if it's too soon. Four hours later, I can't write about something that happened to me four hours ago because I'm still upset. And I would get upset again trying to remember it. A week later, it's fine. Two weeks ago, I dropped one of those big milks in Sainsbury's and it exploded everywhere. And I handled it very, very badly. And I was, well, I just, you know, when you, you, you start to look for something to blame and there was something on the counter that I was trying to put it down on and I was trying to avoid doing this and I was wearing a mask and trying not to sort of touch things. And you just look up and you, what you realize is that everybody else thinks this is your fault. You did that. And what I should have done was apologize incredibly profusely right away. And I'd sort of, I apologized not that profusely when it was a little bit too late, after I'd already made it to some kind of personal outrage being visited on me, even though I'm the one that let go of the milk. You know, for two days, I thought, I can never go back there. Obviously, my wife would not allow me to avoid the Sainsbury's local for the rest of my life. So I, I had to go back within 48 hours. Um, and what was that like? It was fun. Well, it's luckily the same. It wasn't the same people working there at the time. But I mean, I have been back now and seen the people that watched me do that. And are they backing away from you, holding out the figure of a cross? <laughs> it's hard to tell when everyone's got a mask on. I don't know if you've noticed this, but I, when I look at people wearing masks, I tend to see the most benevolent side of them. I look at their kindly eyes and I always imagine everyone has a sort of faint smile underneath, even though they might be swearing under their breath or gnashing their teeth. So you see someone with a mask, and you think, oh, he forgives me. Do you think there's a, a danger of writing yourself into a character so you become a caricature rather than, for example, Tim? Yes, I do think that. I mean, I think that's true to an extent that's unavoidable because I have to, I have, to have some personal privacy. I spend more time, obviously, trying to protect the privacy of people around me, my family, my neighbours, than I do myself. I most of the time, don't mind laying myself bare, but there's a lot of stuff about me that I wouldn't want anyone to know. And the character of me, I suppose, is a, is a, is a guy who doesn't have any of that. You know, he's just this slightly incompetent, mildly petulant person. But there is a door with a do not come further than this y point. Yeah, obviously there are columnists who do do this, but I think you can't really just kind of flay yourself week in, week out for public consumption. It's, it's, it's not good for you. So you've written a book called How to Be Happy All the Time, yeah. which I guess is a slightly cynical thing, but what's the secret to being <laughs> it, happy all the time? It might be more accurate to just say the titles are never my idea. One of those things about being a writer that you're basically bluffing all the time is you sign a contract for a book that already has a title like that, and you haven't done any research, you haven't written a word. All you know is that it's coming out in nine months or 10 months time, and you've just got to do it. Uh, How to Be Happy All the Time is a book about cynicism. Mm -hmm. And it was part of a series. And there were, I think, th this idea that all these things that are meant to be bad for you are great, really. There are lots of those little books about the joy of anger. Is all. Yeah, that's exactly the joy the of anger. The little book so, of anger as opposed exactly. to the little book of calm. Yeah. From that standpoint, that's what this was. But as I sort of dug into it, you think writing a defense of cynicism is very complicated. Cynicism means a lot of different things. Cynicism, like pessimism, you find out quite quickly is, is not good for you. It's associated with terrible health outcomes, if nothing else. And it's not necessarily a great way of looking at the world. But if you look at ancient cynicism, if you look at the philosophy of cynicism, 
there are probably more takeaways there that are worth hanging on to. It's not the same thing as just being cynical all the time, which is a bit like being pessimistic all the time. So share me something from the ancients about being cynical that might be useful for us. Uh, the ancient cynics really, so I'm not an expert, but I've read some books. They despised all forms of falsehood. They despised authority. A lot of their teachings don't exist because they didn't write them down. I can't think of the name of the major cynic. I'm panicking. Oh, sorry. The book is right on my shelf. Diogenes, the cynic. His basic philosophy was boiled down into a series of little aphoristic tales, many of which may not be true. I mean, there's a lot to be cynical about, I guess, with cynicism. The other legends about Diogenes was that he killed himself by holding his own breath. They forsook all worldly goods. They walked around with a cloak, a staff, and a little bag that they kept their stuff in. They slept outside. They did everything outside. And they were a scourge of sort of wealth, privilege, and authority. They preached in the marketplace and basically picked on everyone and made fun of everyone. They sound really annoying, actually. And I think later, that's why we don't like cynics now, is because later on, when it flourished, had a reflourishing 800 years later, and there were these people who were said to be like weekend cynics who picked up the cloak and the staff and went out and harangued people for their, their artifice at weekends and, and begged for alms. And people just got sick of them. Isn't that you being a weekend <laughs> cynic in the sense of you're delivered to us every weekend with a little bit of cynicism, possibly no yes. staff? But... Yes, and, uh, and, uh, and it makes me totally happy. Uh, I just think, it, yeah, that is me slightly. So what would you choose if you had the choice? Would you have a happy life or would you have a meaningful life? I think I would have a meaningful life, although that's a tempting choice you've offered me there. It's not a simple choice. I don't want to say happiness is overrated, but it's, it's a hard thing to chase. Part of it is your attitude about things, your outlook. Part of it is about how much control you feel over gaining or forsaking happiness or whether that sort of thing just comes at you. Whereas meaning is something you can, you, you can try on different meanings. If you can choose to look at a very sad aspect of your life as something that wasn't that bad. So I think it, it's certainly the meaningful life that you're talking about gives you a lot more flexibility. I mean, I think you might be happier trying to be meaningful than you would be if you just sought happiness. Because the problem with the happy life is when you're going through a really bad time, then you've got nothing. Whereas, as you say, with a meaningful life, you might be able to extract some meaning out of mm. what's happening. You might learn something. I don't know that happiness means anything unless you have bad times with which to compare it. Mm. Otherwise, how would you know you were happy? Exactly. I never really thought of this until I read a Ken Wilber. Have you ever heard of Ken Wilber? He has a no. famous book called No Boundaries. And he talks about wherever you try and put a boundary, you immediately have conflict. And what we try and do is we try and put all the nice things over one side and then all the nasty things over the other side and sort of make certain that we have a boundary between the two of them. We live just in the nice side. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, is impossible. But what I've just described is the underlying philosophy of life that's generally put forward in our society. And you don't actually stop and think, can you have one without the other? And actually, some of the things that are in the bad half have some good qualities to them. So, for example, yes. we mentioned anger. Anger is something that most people would say is bad, but anger can get you off the couch and get you marching and changing something. And love, which we think is all wonderful and would be in the good side, sometimes you can love something so much you end up destroying yeah. it. Or you love the wrong thing, yeah. Exactly. So this idea that you can separate and you can have one without the other, I think is really interesting. I don't have that problem anyway. I've, I've never come close to all happiness all the time. It doesn't worry me. How did you come to take up the banjo? It was that midlife crisis era. I suppose I was 44 and... My sister had given her partner a banjo for her for Christmas and I was home and I picked it up and I thought this feels like the solution to all my most intangible problems. I need Gosh. one of these. I don't know why, because I couldn't play it. I can sort of play the guitar in that way that almost anyone can sort of play the guitar. And I sort of engineered that my wife give me one for my 44th birthday. To be honest, I got very frustrated with the banjo almost from the beginning as I started to try and play it. It took me about a year to get anywhere other than simple frustration. But around about that one year mark, I sort of engineered my way into uh, a band. And from then on, it was just playing catch up with proper musicians, just trying to be good enough. 
And so was it the solution to all of your problems? <laughs> it's, I mean, it wouldn't work for everyone, I don't think. But it, it sort of was. It gave me, I think, what you, one of the things you're looking for when you get to that sort of midlife crisis age, not, not that you are necessarily having a crisis, but you might just feel like you're at a crossroads, is something new. Maybe this is my last chance to start something new that takes time. Because if I wait till I'm 60, I'm not going to be able to learn a new instrument well, because that's a 10 to 20 year process. You know, in terms of starting up the banjo, I think I started in the nick of time in the sense that it would have, it would have taken much longer. And it took me to a lot of places that I never thought I would go. It, I didn't think I would end up being in a band. I didn't think I would play on stage as often as I do. I didn't think I would like it. I didn't think I had so much, such a need to make music, I suppose and to write music and to, and to learn. And why do you think you have this need to make music? Well, it's something that I did when I was younger, something I stopped when I was probably 20, 24. I was in bands playing the guitar not very well when I was in my 20s. And I think there are certain things, getting married, having kids, having a career, that kind of get in the way of that. But they also take its place in the sense that you don't have time for anything else. These, these are the things you're meant to feel that are, are achievements. And I think the thing about music is very, very simple. It brings you joy. If you can do it well enough, you can bring other people joy. It's a very, very simple thing. It's a slightly mysterious thing. I work alone in a room by myself all day long. Being in a band is hanging out with seven other people on like tour and stuff. Four dates in the north in a bus. It's great. And I think that actually at midlife, we often need to reconnect with things that we've dumped from when we were young, that we said to ourselves, oh, I've got to concentrate on the serious business of having a career and making money. And we throw out some of our passions that we need to come back to and almost reinvigorate ourselves at midlife. And it's interesting that you had played in bands when you were younger. Did you have that sense of reconnecting with some of that passion that you'd thrown out? Yes, I did. And also, I think when you approach these kind of things when you're older, you do it with a certain amount of wisdom and, and care and, and respect for other people that you don't have when you're 20. I mean, one of the things I distinctly remember about being sort of 19 and in a four-person band was that we used to fight all the time. And there's sort of rages about how something would go or somebody not practicing or not showing up on time. I mean, I think every band, no matter how terrible you are, has this kind of underlying dream of the big time. And it's, it's very frustrating. It's very frustrating not to be good or to have gigs that no one comes to. And your ego is always being sort of bruised and battered or you're trying to batter and bruise somebody else's. And they always end badly, bands, when you're young. They always, you know... It ends up being three people who you ain't friends with anymore. And you can still speak to everybody in Police Dog Home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at, the, at the time Most of going to press. Most of the time. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, it's amazing when you get the other thing you get to a certain age, and we all have a certain amount of time to be able to throw at this. Lockdown and, and COVID, you know, destroyed our ability to rehearse for a long time. And, and we didn't see each other. And you really miss it. You don't realize how much you miss it because... Do you think about other things? What I also think is interesting about your banjo career is that this is something that I'm guessing has a certain meaning in your life. But unlike when we're younger, we think something that's meaningful has to bring in money. I would be surprised if your work with Police Dog Hogan is for the money. It's for the love, I assume. It's, it's not for the money. We try to make it wash its face. It shouldn't be costing us so much money that we, that we hate it because of that. What you find out is you can have all the experiences of being in a band, the highs and the lows, and a little bit of the bickering and infighting without any of the success. You don't need any of that. You can even have strange things like super fans. You get super fans before you get fans. Suddenly you find somebody who's listened to everything you've ever heard and comes to every single gig you do. And you think, oh my God. I think they're always disappointed that we're not more popular. You know, that there isn't a, a backdrop of sort of slightly lazier fanship against which their devotion could shine out. And they all know each other. That's embarrassing. They're, all your fans kind of know each other. Hi, hi. You, you know all of them by name yeah, as well. Of course, not quite David yeah. Bowie, is it? They're generally couples, retired couples. So when you meet your public, what do they want to ask you about? If I'm doing a sort of book thing or a, or a journalism thing, generally one of the first questions is they want to know if my wife is there. Is your wife here? Which one is your wife? 
Uh, and the answer is usually no. She's heard me speak. <laughs> she doesn't need to hear this again. Uh, but she occasionally, if it's like a fun place, or when our son was at university, if it was in the town where he was at university and there was a free hotel going, then she would come. And actually, that, that's true of the band thing. I mean, people will stop the band between songs and say, is your wife here? That's mostly what they want to know. It's not I'm with the band. It's is your wife with the band? Yeah. As she says, I'm the funny one. You just write it down. Do you have a greatest hit when it comes to your column, the one that everybody wants to talk about? They're very keen on the ones. I mean, the thing is, now I've done it. I've done it for however many years. There are probably nearly in excess of 600 of them, I would say, out there. And and so it's not so much the columns, it's the themes, because a lot of people don't tune into, they don't read it every week. So they're very keen on anything to do with pets. And they fall into specific categories, the dog people, the cat people. And then there's, to a lesser extent, the tortoise people. I'm afraid I fit into the dog people <laughs> category. So. Well, that's fine. So technically, so do I. And what's it like seeing yourself through other people's eyes? It's alarming because you... You, you, nobody likes to be summed up, which is something I've learned about writing about other people, is, is you have to be very careful. They don't like it to be praised in any way. You get that. You know that thing where you have, if you have a, your workplace has a website and there's a little bio of you and a little picture, you think, this is ridiculous. These words cannot contain me. I'm so much more than this. And they may have even made you write it yourself, you know, but everybody hates three paragraphs about what they're like. And I, I am no exception to that. Even when you write it yourself, you are giving people permission, I suppose, to make assumptions about you, to feel like they know you, to feel like they know what you would do in any given situation when I don't know that myself about myself. And you rebel against that. A little bit. But I think that's part of the fun of it is that you are trying to defy expectation. I mean, that's part of making people laugh. And that's part of it just being generally good is you're trying to surprise people so one of the things I like to write about myself is times and places and things I'd say that I wouldn't normally say because circumstances have forced me to be a little bit different than I would normally be. So in a moment, we're going to see what a cynic is going to make of one of the letters that's been sent to me. But before we do that, let me give you a little bit of information about our supporters club. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Please follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material and other benefits. Hello, I'm Andrew G. Marshall. It's The Meaningful Life. My guest is Tim Dowling. And one of the advantages of joining our supporters club is that you can write a letter that the eyes are going to be cast over of myself and my guest. And Tim, I'd like you to help my guest get a bit of an insight into the male brain, because I think you've had quite a bit of time trying to understand men and why they do things and the traps they fall into. <laughs> so here is the letter. My husband is having an affair. I first became suspicious four or five months ago. I found out for sure earlier this month. I just found emails proving that they're sleeping together. He claimed that hadn't happened yet. When I caught them earlier this month, he tried to move out immediately, said she's the love of my life, she's perfect, he'd never want me again. Two weeks ago, he said he was confused. His feelings change daily. He doesn't know what he wants. Maybe he'll move home. She's not worth long distance. Maybe he wants me, even though he says he was unhappy for a long time and doesn't love me romantically, says he never said she was his true love. My question, why start lying about being confused? He knows he wants her. He says he's not looking for a new place to live. I know he is. Is he just that much of a coward that even though he insisted he didn't want me to have false hope, he's giving me false hope just to rip up the carpet from underneath me again? Why does he feel I deserve this? I don't understand. Now, the male brain. Help us understand the male brain. There's a question in the middle of that series of questions that is like the central question, which is, is he just that much of a coward? To which I would just say, yeah, he is. I don't know about you, but I feel like I've heard this story many times before amongst acquaintances in the general circle. This has occurred over and over again. 
it, it has fallen out more or less this way, is that somebody has an affair, then runs off and says a lot of hard to repair things on the way out the door. And then within, within a surprisingly short time, you find they've changed their minds or are starting to feel out, you know, test the water of what it might be like to try and give up and come back. And so why do you think men are cowards when it comes to dealing with women? I think they're, they're afraid of strong emotion in others and in, in themselves. I think they don't like being held responsible for, for trauma that they've caused in other people especially in that realm of strong emotion where they're not comfortable anyway. It's hard to know without, because it's obviously the letter is not from the man. But, you know, it sounds as if he's trying to find the path of least resistance through the stormiest waters possible that he's kind of churned up for himself. But who knows what? I think that's interesting that um, he's trying to find the line of least resistance. Is that something that appeals to you sometimes, the line of least resistance? Often, yeah. I mean, the, the line of least resistance is my main path. I think you, you do have to throw yourself in the way of trouble sometimes in order to get yourself out of that. But that, obviously, that may indeed be what's happened here. I mean, we're talking about a marriage, whether a marriage is going to survive or not. And another thing that surprised me, having heard this story time and time again, is that relationships do survive things like this. And maybe more often than they don't. It's all that sort of hurt that's been stirred up, that all these things that probably should never have been said that got said, and it's finding a way back from that, that I think is the hardest thing, and, and a very hard thing for men. And yet there, there really is no other way back. So I think the question at the very end is a really important one. Why does he feel I deserve this? And I would say, he doesn't think you deserve this. What's happened is you are collateral damage. Although mm. it feels like this is all about you, it's actually about him. And unfortunately, you were the person that was in the relationship with him at that particular time. Yeah. I mean, I don't think she says, why start lying about being confused? I don't think he's lying about being confused. I think he's very, very confused. And I think he was probably confused about his life before he even met this woman. One of the things I was talking about with Tim, which I think is relevant, is this sort of feeling that in your mid-40s, your life begins to fall apart. It's the hardest part because a lot of the things we did in the first part of our life aren't actually needed in the second part of our lives. You know, And it could be that we need to entirely rethink. We need to find our banjo for it. Yeah. Unfortunately, what instead of finding the banjo, he found this woman. I think a banjo would have helped here, possibly. Yeah, probably a little bit earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I had a, a, a client who uh, got through her midlife crisis through playing the ukulele. There's something about these slightly ridiculous instruments like the ukulele and the banjo that somehow brings so much joy and it doesn't actually harm anybody beyond hearing you rehearse. They can always close the door. An affair is actually a very destructive thing to do. And although we're laughing, I think we do have to remember just how incredibly destructive this is, not just to you, but to him as well. Because I think what at the very bottom of this is not thinking enough. Yeah. He was probably having these sort of, what am I going to do with my life thoughts, but he kept on pushing those away. And what happens when you push things away is that actually they don't disappear, they just get bigger and bigger. And so this sort of hole about what am I going to do with the rest of my life got greater and greater. Or pushing away the feelings makes you more and more depressed. And there's one thing that will get you out of depression and potentially find you a bit of short-term meaning is an affair because suddenly your life is full, admittedly of chaos, but th there's no shortage of things to do. And it seems terribly meaningful because through the eyes of an affair, you probably see the world rather differently. And for a short time, this seems like the answer. This is why she's perfect is because she's the solution. But within about 15 minutes, she becomes the source of all the chaos. So it's yeah. not actually the solution. It's actually making everything even worse. Or she didn't have as much riding on all this as you did. She wasn't trying to throw all the balls up in the air and see where they land the way you are. So she's got a life to go back to, perhaps. Mm. And he's left hanging in midair, really, looks like. Yeah, that's something that our correspondence possibly needs to think about. It could be 
that your husband has rather misunderstood how keen the other woman actually is. And maybe she's getting cold feet too. Mm. Maybe that might be part of it. But it's not about you. It's about some crisis in his life. And it's about whether he's actually going to have the courage to look at his true feelings rather than running around and distracting. It's a, a question of, you're going to have the courage to be honest with you, not just about what's been going on, but about his feelings. And can the two of you stay in what I call the crucible of conflict long enough to see if there's a way through all of this? Because one of the great things about an affair, and this sounds strange for me to say one of the great things about an affair, is it brings all the problems in a relationship up to the surface. You get a chance to really look at what's going on, the things that should have been said but have never been said before in the chaos get said. And once something's actually been said, you can begin to talk about it and then you might be able to change it. But if you're actually just sort of sidling past each other and not disturbing each other too much and just talking about the dog, none of these issues yeah. come to the surface and can't be solved. So it's horrible, but it is the opportunity to do things differently. Lots of people don't actually grasp that, but lots of people do. So I hope that this is going to be the beginning of a conversation between the two of you where you could find out something new and different, something meaningful. And so rather than your husband's been going for what he thinks is going to be the happy life, but maybe he needs to have a more meaningful life. Yeah. I suppose in the meantime, though, do you need some sort of self-protection from somebody, as you said, collateral damage, somebody who's changing their mind back and forth, who's kind of blowing up your life anew every day at the moment? You, you are just waiting around to hear, aren't you? I think it's a good piece of advice. I think you need to put up a wall between the two of you, an emotional wall. You'll be there to listen. You'll be there to talk to him. But actually, if you lay yourself open too much when he's in this chaotic time, he's going to come in and either love bomb you or stab you. And both of them are pretty horrible. So I think you do need to have some defences at this time. I do think it's really important that maybe you have a best friend who's going to calm you down when it's all horrible and build you up a little bit and also stop you from getting too excited when he mm. seems to be making one step backwards or maybe find a, a therapist to do that task. Tim, thank you for being my witness on the meaningful life. The big question is, what makes your life meaningful? Well, as we sort of touched on before, in these times, we are, we're trying to learn to live in the present, I think. And as I said, I think, you know, what really makes my life meaningful, generally speaking, is writing about it. But that is a constant going over of my past and editing and a re-editing and a reshaping that allows me to sort of tell us a narrative, spin a narrative that, that I can go back and adjust whenever I want. I suppose the, the downside to that is that I don't live as much in the present as I could. I don't look outside and just enjoy where I am right now. So I think this year we've had an opportunity to do that, and uh, I've tried to seize it. And you said that meaning is something you assign to our lives. What have you assigned to your life? <laughs> um, that is a very good question. Uh, I think, I think what you what are you trying to to sort of gather up as you go through life that counts for anything in the end? Uh, I mean, maybe wisdom. If you, if you can hang on to anything that you could call wisdom, and that comes from a constant reassessing of the past. Maybe trying to make connections with other people that are themselves meaningful, and that's, I do have a lot of that. I have a wife and children, and, and, and that brings meaning into my life. But you, you, you get to an age, I suppose, where you think, maybe I, maybe I should be stretching that a bit. Maybe I should be reaching out to people who, who are either from my past that I haven't seen in a while, or, or, you know, it's a weird time to make new friends, your late 50s, but it's, it's not a bad idea. I think that it's always a good idea to make new friends because there's a chance to be a slightly different person. It's terribly reassuring to have, mm. I have a, a friend I've known since I was seven years old and we don't see each other that often, but when we 
pick up again, it is the most wonderful experience to actually be with somebody who's known you that length of time. But it's also wonderful. I've got a a new friend I met because another friend said, this person is setting up a practice. Can you give some advice on how to set up a practice in Berlin where I live? And so we met for sort of coffee as a, a favor. And like two and a half hours later, we were still talking 10 to the dozen. And this is somebody who I can explore very much who I am today and who I want to be in the future rather than actually being burdened with all that past from yeah. all those years. So I think it's really good to have new friends. You get recontextualized a little bit. Yeah, and you can discover new things. And there could be things about them that interest you and that you want to find out more about. So you're not just going down the same old groove again. Yeah. So I think actually finding new friends in your 50s is really important. Actually, new friends at any age. And I mean, I'm at a crossroads at the moment because I don't, I, I need a new project. I need to commit to it and I need to set aside the time to do it. And it, I'm finding that very hard. You know, a lot of people have seized this year of, of lockdown to, to do things. And I, I, I conspicuously haven't. I've kept going and I've tried not to beat myself up about not achieving marvelous things. But uh, I haven't seized that. And I think, I, in a way, you need the sort of freedom to sort of move about in order to sit down and concentrate. I have a question for you that might be helpful for that. And that is, what is trying to come into the world through me? Oh. So instead of actually thinking, what can I do? What do I want to do? Yeah. Actually giving enough time for your unconscious to deliver some of those answers. Our general sense is, what do you want to do and go for it? But this is actually giving enough space to let the idea emerge from within. What is trying to come into the world through you? What do you think of that way of approaching it? So is this a process? Am I asking myself the question and then... Letting it brew. Wait, waiting for the answer to appear. Yeah, yeah, I think that's probably good because I think one of the maybe one of the problems is that I am thinking in terms of a specific project that has gone a bit stale on me. And maybe I need to stop thinking about that one, think about something else. Maybe the reason it's gone stale is that it doesn't need to come into the world. I'm going to sound a bit cosmic now, mm -hmm. but sometimes we do projects. I mean, I did one myself that everybody else said would be a good idea and I should do it. And I never really did it beyond the thought, thought I, you know, it might be successful, which is a pretty lousy reason to do something. Yeah. Whereas this project, The Meaningful Life, is something that emerged. I suddenly thought, hang on, I can combine my years in radio with my experience as a therapist, and this might be something that would be useful to the world. And it'd be useful to me because talking to other people about what makes life meaningful is going to help me. And you can't find the answer just yourself because there's no one answer. So that's why I talk to lots of other people to see what they have to, to say. So this sort of came into the world through me rather than me saying, oh, what's going to, what am I going to do next with my career sort of thing, or which I have spent a lot of time trying to think about. And who knows if this is going to be good for my career or not? I don't care. But it wants to come into the world through me. Yeah, sometimes I think we, depending on what sort of work ethic you were brought up with, you feel a bit guilty about things that haven't gone through sort of terrible birth pangs. And if something is such a good idea that it starts to come together almost by itself, you feel a bit guilty about how easy it was. And, and, and you tend to perversely think of the things that you didn't really enjoy, but were very hard to do as being the more worthwhile. Well, good luck with that project, whatever it might be, Tim. I think I think we oh, will you know. uh, look forward to it, because if it's as good as the columns, I think it's going to be worth watching. Uh, thank you very much. In a moment, because this is where we say goodbye to Tim on the podcast, but if you're a supporter, you will find out what Tim has learned from talking to me and what I've learned from talking to him. I'm sure he's going to give me a cynical answer, but I'm going to be <laughs> as truthful as possible. And if you want to find out more about being a member of our supporters club, go to www.andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcasts. So Tim, thank you very much for being my guest on The Meaningful Life. Thank you. A pleasure. You've been listening to The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. You can follow Andrew on Twitter, like him on Facebook, and please leave a review wherever you consume your podcasts. 
Making, editing, and distributing The Meaningful Life comes with substantial costs, and we'd like to ask for your help. Visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material for every program, send in a letter to be discussed by Andrew and his guests, and join a community of other people seeking to make their life meaningful. At the gold level, you get even more benefits. Production of The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall is by Michael Dooney. Social media by Madeleine Healy. Sound engineering and theme tune by Sebastian de la Luz Mendoza. And I'm Susie Colick. Please tell your friends and spread the word. Thank you.